This video explores a new hydrogen technology that will deliver over four times the power density of the fuel cells currently in cars. And I've been granted special access to go and see them in person. Hi, I'm Val Niftikoff, uh, founder and CEO of Zeravia. We're here in our location in uh, Sandwich Kent, uh, where we have high temperature fuel cell technology development. Zero emission aviation is often seen as the final frontier of clean transportation. And now, Zero Avia's new hydrogen fuel cells could unlock flights some people thought would be impossible. At Zero Avia, we're working on the next generation of power plants or engine replacements for commercial aviation. So we're targeting larger aircraft uh, going longer distances. For that type of aircraft, um, which is the majority, vast majority of the emissions uh, from aviation, what's important is high energy density and high specific energy amount of energy that you can put on the aircraft and the amount of power that you can generate per unit of mass and volume. And that's where we believe hydrogen is the only answer. And hydrogen electric specifically, or hydrogen fuel cell based uh, power plants are the right answer. Time Magazine has named Zero Avia the number one green tech company of 2024. Part of this title comes from their breakthrough development of turbocharging high temperature hydrogen fuel cells. So how do high temperature fuel cells work and why are they so much more power dense? In January 2023, Zero Avia flew the world's biggest hydrogen electric aircraft using a more standard low temperature fuel cell in its powertrain. Regional airlines are placing orders for their hydrogen electric engines, but for Zero Avia, these are just steps towards powering bigger planes that emit only water vapor and heat. To understand Zero Avia's high temperature fuel cell, it's probably useful to look at the technology they're building on and disrupting. The most popular fuel cells use a proton exchange membrane, or PEM, to induce the chemical reaction that generates electricity. PEM fuel cells were developed by General Electric researchers in the 1960s and used for NASA's Gemini space program. There are three critical components to the fuel cell, and they're stacked up in layers. The bipolar plates on either side hold the whole stack together and marshal the flow of molecules. The gas diffusion layers, usually carbon cloth or carbon paper, act like crowd control, making sure everything flows evenly into the main arena. Together with the catalysts and membrane, these make up the membrane electrode assembly, or MEA. Hydrogen gas and oxygen from the air arrive at separate entrances. Hydrogen is split into protons and electrons via a catalyst layer, usually platinum. The proton exchange membrane allows the protons through to the cathode, but the electrons can't gain entry. Instead, they're pushed through an electrical circuit, creating electricity before reaching the cathode, where they rejoin the protons and oxygen to form water. The only other byproduct is heat. So the three critical components of the whole operation are the bipolar plates, gas diffusion layers, and membrane electrode assembly, or MEA. As I mentioned before, most fuel cells run at low temperatures. They're known as LT PEMs, and power cars like the Toyota Mirai and new Honda CRV. Low operating temperatures between 65 and 90 degrees Celsius make these systems reliable and durable. But keeping them at the right temperature requires significant effort from heavy water cooling systems, known as part of the balance of plant components not great for planes. This is where Zero Avia saw an opportunity. So hi, I'm Rudolf, head of R&D at Zero Avia. The high temperature fuel cells operate at a higher uh, temperature, but also for our specific uh, implementation and our novel implementation of it, we use direct air cooling, which then of course saves a lot of the balance of plant uh, components in terms of we don't need additional heat exchangers. <clears throat> and we don't need um, additional coolant pumps and you save all the, the coolant fluid that you, that you would have uh, in a typical low temperature uh, liquid cooled uh, PEM fuel cell uh, stack and system. This seemingly simple change from low temperature to high temperature is what allows the air cooling system to work. Because although air cooling isn't as effective as liquid cooling, the hotter the fuel cell is, the easier it is to cool. This is because hot things want to cool down quicker than cold things as well as reducing the need for complex water cooling systems, one of the genius ways Zero Avia's system uses the extra heat and pressure is for turbocharging, similar to in a car. 
powertrain consists of two main parts. It's a power generation part and a fuel tank with the fuel. So you should care about weight of both and volume of both and uh, efficiency. Efficiency uh, allow you to minimize hydrogen consumption and reduce your tank weight and tank volume. To address this challenge, we developed uh, two barrel fuel cell system, which uh, combines, first in the world, uh, combines turbocharging of fuel cells and air cooling. And this allows us to maximize power output uh, of the fuel cell system and uh, to, get, uh, or to, to get over two kilowatt per kilogram for the system level and uh, minimize weight, therefore minimize weight of the system. When you operate at high altitude, you have to compress air four or five times, uh, some for high altitudes even more, and that's a huge power you need, you have to spend for compression. And uh, this uh, affects on your efficiency if you do not care how, how to recover uh, this power. All ga gases, including reactant gases, passing through the system increases temperature, expands, and uh, uh, can provide more mechanical power on a, an expander, on an expander, and uh, that's the way we uh, recover power uh, and to return this power to the system. That's uh, one of the key points. Whereas a lot of low temperature systems, like on the Toyota Mirai, use an electric compressor to increase the pressure and therefore oxygen density of the incoming air, a turbo is much more efficient. This is because it uses energy that would otherwise be lost in the exhaust to spin a turbine, which then in turn spins a compressor that it is mechanically linked to. The output of this compressor is oxygen-dense air that can then be fed into the fuel cell. We have a lot of uh, extra heat and uh, th there are a lot of uh, ideas and options how to use this heat, for example, anti-icing uh, procedures. With HDPM you have a lot of benefits and opportunities how, how to use this heat for, for aircrafts. We are at the beginning of our way and I believe we will find a lot of brilliant ideas how to use this heat. And, uh, but the main idea right now is to get lightweight and extremely efficient powertrain power system for, uh, for aircrafts and we are going to have it in, in the coming years. After hearing this, I couldn't help but think, why isn't everyone else doing this? But as it turns out, when you go to high temperatures, things get a lot more complicated. So the team took me on a tour to show me these challenges and their innovative solutions. Now, the complex projects these scientists and engineers at Zero AVR are working on may seem daunting, but with the right tools, anyone can start learning STEM subjects. Which is why before this tour, I have to tell you about Brilliant, who is supporting this video and made it all possible. Brilliant lets you learn by doing, and is the best way to help reach your goals for understanding maths, science, and engineering at your own pace. They have thousands of lessons from the basics up to advanced levels, and they helped me during my studies to start understanding so many new topics. The lessons are seriously fun to do and can be done in bite-sized sections to fit around your busy schedule, whether you're a professional, student, or just lifelong learner. I've always struggled with chemistry, which can make fuel cells pretty difficult to understand at first. However, brilliant courses make any topic from chemistry to astrophysics approachable for anyone. There are also courses with fantastic real world examples, like getting hands on with a large language model similar to the one behind ChatGPT. Whether it's for career progression or your own curiosity, you're definitely going to love Brilliant. So use my link at brilliant.org slash Xeroth to get started free for 30 days. Okay, now let's look at the inside layers of this fuel cell and how they made this breakthrough possible. First, let's see how they've made incredibly lightweight aluminium robust enough for the corrosive environment of the fuel cell. Aluminum bipolar blades, and uh, which is uh, very good in thermal conductivity, which is really good in rejection of the heat produced by the operation of the fuel cell. Uh, what is the challenge here? That uh, technology operates uh, with a phosphoric acid as electrolyte and at the elevated temperature up to 200 degrees C. And in this condition, aluminum cannot survive as a metal, so it will dissolve. And uh, so that was a first in every technology we as R&D function supported to develop the special protective and same time conductive faulting. But this is just uh, the aluminum by bullet plate as we get it from our vendor, from our supplier. And uh, this is uh, really, really light. 
what we do, what we do here actually in this particular room, uh, that we buy the, our first layer or the metallic layer. This is a multi-company, multi-element uh, coating, several metal elements and inorganic elements. Uh, and uh, the function of this coating to provide the conductivity and to uh, reduce the surface resistivity of this uh, uh, plate but same time to protect and to, to introduce some corrosion protection. This is the bare aluminum. This is already with the first coating and layer. So, and why has it got this dimpled shape? This is a flow field. So that's, that's where the reacting gases uh, kind of diffuse and getting distributed over the surface of the bipolar plate because flow field kind of enables the very good diffusion and penetration of the gases through the whole surface of the active array because that's the area where the reaction happens. Uh, this surface, this particular surface, needs to be very, very conductive so that pick up these electrons and to convey this charge to the to the uh, kind of uh, current current connector area of the bipolar plate. Let's see, you take the aluminium bipolar plate and that goes into one of these tanks? And yeah, gets, it's, it's it actually goes filled. to the different tanks and on each oh, tank okay. there is some process where happens with the surface of this uh, uh, bipolar plate uh, and finally, yeah, the final tank is just wash out all the chemicals on the surface Okay. And then it's drying on the oven, in the oven. With that, I would like just to mention that uh, actually this is not just uh, the, the final look of the, of the bipolar plate. Uh, to make it ready to go to the stack, we uh, fold with, with a second layer. And this is a uh, polymer composite layer. And actually this second layer, also about 5-10 microns, but uh, it generates the major contribution to the corrosion protection of the, of the bipolar plate. The key purpose of all of these coatings is it primarily corrosion protection and uh, conductivity? Yeah, uh, actually, actually, if you if you take just the aluminum mm. and you go to the fuel cell, yeah, it, it will survive there for I don't know uh, several minutes, uh, mm. ten minutes, etc. But it will work uh, not so efficient as, for example, this <laughs> bipolar yeah, plate yeah. with a coating. So those are the bipolar plates. The incredible bookends that sandwich the other layers together, marshal the molecules, and conduct electricity. With Zero Avia's proprietary coating, they have for the first time enabled aluminium to survive the harsh conditions in a high temperature fuel cell. Next up, I met Chief Engineer Rhonda Stout. She showed me the main arena of the fuel cell concert, the membrane electrode assembly. We have the ability to make our own um high temperature MEAs, and what the MEA consists of is cathode electrode and an anode electrode. And then we put a piece of membrane in between, and it's really just making a sandwich. <laughs> and then we put this into our hot press. It's a tasty machine, ha basically. A hot, <laughs> yeah, like a, a hot sandwich. <laughs> what would come out would be, you know, an assembled MEA that looks and like what does MEA stand for? Uh, membrane electrode assembly. And then to operate it, we put it between the flow fields. So on one side, we have our hydrogen flowing, and on the other side is the air. And that's how we um, create the electricity. Is this a testing device to make sure yes. that the previous process we've done here is working? Right, and we are developing um, new catalysts so that we can improve the performance um, and make the MEA better for aviation, yeah. aviation applications. So then this little baby goes over into the test area. So we can evaluate um, how well it performs. The electrodes Rhonda showed me are made of a carbon cloth and have a catalyst that is turned into an ink and printed onto it. The catalyst is an essential part that splits the hydrogen into protons and electrons. Since their invention in the 1830s, platinum has been used as a catalyst in fuel cells, but entire rods were used, which turns out to be a pretty inefficient way of using a precious metal. Catalyst team lead Dr. Aranchander Askin showed me a bit more about their catalyst coating. Uh, so I'm not sure you can see. <laughs> uh, it's a platinum carbon catalyst. Yeah, so uh, you can't so, see platinum. 
The reason we couldn't see platinum here is because it's mixed in with carbon, known as the supporting material, to make the catalyst more efficient and economical. Is this your... Is this your... my experience. Why this uh, measurement is? This uh, particular uh, measurement will give precise uh, catalyst information. So it's quicker, more accurate, and then once you find something that looks yeah. promising, you can make sure yes. it works with yes. everyone else's. Yes, true. And finally, the electrode development for the MEA, led by Dr. Emerald Taylor. She talked me through how they sped up the reactions on the oxygen side of the fuel cell to increase efficiency. That reaction is much slower. Yeah. It can be a bit clunky. It's a bit like when you wake up on a Sunday morning and you just don't <laughs> want to get out of bed, right? <laughs> and so we have to work through. smartly to really get it going, running and working as hard as the hydrogen Got you. oxidation reaction, right? We also have to deal with the generation of water because water is our byproduct. So we have gas coming in, we have water vapor coming out, and we need to manage all of that. So we need to be able to reject that and repel that from the cathode so we can run at high current densities produce more power, but also manage all of these different nuances of the cathode. It's a very complicated little potion that we're trying to make. With the bipolar plates, gas diffusion layers, and membrane electrode interfaces all in order, it was time to stack it up. Of course, we start with the first bipolar plate at, at the very end for the, for, for the one, let's say the negative uh, terminal. And then we start with the membrane electrode assembly and then bipolar plate and then we alternate them. And they stack up. Uh, in series, because you build the fuel cell stacks power also by stacking all the cells in series. So you're, you're trying to get a particular voltage as well? Correct, yes, because the, uh, the typical voltage for, uh, for a fuel cell, one fuel cell by itself, uh, at no load is around about 1.2 volts, or around about 1.1 volt. Yeah. And as you draw more load from it, of course, the voltage goes down to around about 0.6 or 0.5 volts. This stacking of cells is similar to putting batteries in series to get a desired voltage from the overall battery pack. On the next part of my tour, Dr. Sergei Panov gave me some extra details about the fuel cell as it starts to take its final form. During the assembly of the stack, the quality is examined and the layers are built into their stack carefully using guided supports. This naked stack is then put into a casing for testing. Here you can see the quarter stack in one uh, fourth of the stack and short stack. Uh, just to validate that, that everything goes well and everything works properly, we assemble first the short stack is consists of only six cells, it consists of 44 cells. And we put uh, this equipment on a test station just to validate that our design works. After all of this is completed, they go on to be tested and validated to make sure everything works as hoped as they vary parameters like temperature and pressure. And we want to do it in as much of an isolated condition so we're just evaluating how the MEA, the membrane electrode assembly forms. We also have right here Oh, wow. A, a single full size cell being tested under the same conditions where we can control the temperature very well, control the pressure very well, and evaluate the full size MEA. The complete stack is then put into a test rig that looks ready for a trip to Mars. The rig is designed for full stacks, but on the day, a small stack was being tested for its specific power, and it was also being tested for durability. Zeravia is aiming to get 10,000 hours in a future iteration of the system. And although aeroplanes are the obvious application, high temperature fuel cells could definitely be used in other places. When you think about other applications where large powers are required, like for example, um, heavy trucks, uh, heavy duty machinery, marine uh, ships, and even in trains, those are applications where HTPM technology can definitely bring a very big advantage uh, because of the thermal management advantages that you have. And then if you put on top of that, the, especially for mobile applications, the lightweight type of uh, fuel cell stacks that we are developing and overall systems that we are creating will be quite beneficial for a lot of applications outside of aviation. Of course, our focus at the moment is um, aviation, and this is Zero Avia's mission, but those um, could be other opportunities that could become available downstream for us as well. One big question beyond all of this technology is how the production, storage, and refueling of hydrogen would work in practice. Zero Avia isn't just thinking about the technology in their fuel cell. 
but on the entire chain from hydrogen production through to its use. To be zero emissions, they'd have to use green hydrogen, so they are making their own and partnering with other providers. Though this will become a much larger project as more planes take to the skies. Of course, uh, there are challenges on this uh, path, and uh, if there are no challenges, they would have been done already, um, and it hasn't been. So there are challenges, but uh, we believe that we can solve them. Uh, some of them include uh, regulatory environment, for example, right? It's new technology. Aviation is a regulatory heavy industry. Things take time. Um, but uh, we've been working with regulators uh, in the US, in the UK, and in continental Europe for a number of years now. Uh, we have flown a number of prototypes, uh, so the regulators are very familiar with our technology. So we believe we can actually push the first uh, set of uh, engines into the market within the next two years, two, two and a half years, so 2025, 2026. Some regulations are also working in Zero Avia's favor, as they make traditionally fueled flight more expensive. And as subsidies are given to cleaner alternatives, using renewable energy gives operators significant cost advantages. Changing commercial aviation over to hydrogen is a huge challenge, but with a step change in fuel cell technology from turbocharged high temperature fuel cells, combined with global efforts and funding, there's something seriously going on here. Of course, there are some who think this is too big of a challenge. Then again, the same was said for solo flight across the Atlantic and space travel. If you've enjoyed this video, please subscribe. It's free and it helps support this channel a lot to make videos like this possible. I also think you might like some of my other videos like this one on a new type of propeller. And as always, thanks for watching.